Okay. Um, so let's see. What did you want to talk about today? Um, I actually have some uh, questions about running tests, and it kind of relates to um, your first video about compilations. Okay. So a um, couple questions. The debug, w when you're compiling for the tests, does it also compile and debug by default? Like, does it follow the config.toml? Yeah, that's a great question. So here, let me share my screen and we can, we can walk through a little bit of this. Um, let me figure out the brightness of the share. Yeah, I'll share this one. Um, so the answer here is that um, the config.toml has settings that control this, but it's not going to, I don't believe it just inherits the, um, the settings that are used from the, the, the main build. So yeah, like we've reviewed in the, in the first video, there are these things about debug equals false and and optimize equals true in the in the rust session <laughs> but there's a separate area um regarding the tests and in particular i believe like this is what you care about for that for the compile for, i assume you're talking about the compile tests that are the compiler tests are all the things i believe that are under source test or actually nowadays the test that, that we've removed it all to be under test instead i have to update my repository but the point is the things that are like the UI tests um, that are tests of the compiler itself, those are uh, all driven by the compile test program. That's the thing that's like doing the checking of the error annotations and whatnot. Uh, so a good example here might be this thing here where we have these these um, these tildes and error and, and various things like that. That's all driven by compile test. And so if you look in the config, there's an example config.toml that lists all the settings you can choose. And that is where you could set saying, I want different settings for um, the tests. And so, yeah, I think that's the main thing is that this, this controls, when you say debugging, <clears throat> you're talking about the, like the dash G option, passing that in terms of like having it include debug info with the test. Um, you mean? I think my biggest concern is just that it doesn't slow down the compile times when I'm trying to run tests. Yeah, well, but the compile times, the compile times themselves, the compiler, that's gonna be driven by how the compiler itself is built. Um, and so if you want your compiler to run as fast as possible when it's compiling the tests, then that is the thing for that's in this, um, the Rust setting of, of up here under the Rust section and this debug equals false. So yeah, I guess my answer may have sounded contradictory. Um, it's something where you have a compiler that you're building. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna turn off screen sharing for a second to see if I can, uh, uh, can I turn on screen sharing? Let's see, how do I do it? Come on, Zoom, help me help me figure this out. Um, so, the, the point is that you've got the compiler that we've built and that has a set of settings and the it's going to be have the optimized optimized setting which you probably set the true and it's going to have the debug setting that controls whether the assertions on or on or off and whether it has the debug logging turned on and off and so the test suite is going to be written run with whatever compiler you built either way so if you want to have the compiler run as fast as possible on the test suite then you need to turn optimizations on and debugging off for the compiler. I'm, but I really advise against that while you're in an inter, beginning development because in particular, you want those assertions running um, against the compiler when you're doing things in development, you want to have the internal checks happening to make sure that whatever you did isn't breaking some internal invariant of the compiler while you're still learning about the compiler. I can understand the motivation of saying, oh, I want the test to run as fast as possible. So I guess once you're, if you're really confident that your test, that your, your code change is, is sound, is, is correct, and you really do just want to see the effect it has on the semantics of the, the compiler in terms of like what out, how the output changes in diagnostics, for example, then sure, then you could have a debug equals false, optimize equals true setting for the compiler and, and run the test suite as fast as possible. But I just don't want to, I don't want to encourage that being the default when one's learning about doing, um, contributing to the compiler itself because those internal debug checks and the logs that you get access to the, 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 
the Rusty log environment variable thing where you can turn in the instrumentation and get those log pronouns. Those are also so useful uh, to, to jump into when you have a test that's not behaving the way you expect. Having a compiler ready to go that has those available is important. But the more important thing is the assertions. That's that's the thing I really want to stress is a reason um, to not turn off debugging. So, okay, I didn't... Could you talk a little bit more about those assertions? I mean, I knew about yeah. the logs, but not about... Um... Oh, sure. sure the assertions are involved. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So um, the debug equals true setting is going to do two things. It's going to um, it's going to turn on the logs, and it's also going to enable um, debug assertions, which in Rust are basically asserts that are written, I think, as debug assert like that, where it's debug underscore and then the assert keyword. So in Rust, typically, when you just have a assert on its own, you put some 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 uh, test expression in here, and this is always these these assertions will always be run. Um, oh wait, sorry, I just realized I'm on screen check. Let me let me. I, <laughs> I, did was, it again. I was waiting to in, yeah, uh, interrupt yeah, you. Yeah. Got a good. Point. No, no, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, let me try again. So you've got in Rust, there's two things to be aware of. There's the assert macro, and then you can just put arbitrary boolean expression here, um, and that will always get compiled into the code, and it will. In, in any any uh, mode in terms of release or debug or you know the, the, those two modes that you fit, feed into cargo for how to compile programs and so the assert macro will always inject its test expression and it'll always test run it check the boolean flag and issue a panic if it doesn't hold but there's plenty of situations where people say well i've got tests that i want to do that are checking internal invariants but they are expensive enough that I don't want them in my release product. And so for that, there's a debug assert macro. And the intention is that this has the same semantics as assert in terms of checking some test expression, but it's not gonna be included in the binary unless you are compiling um, in debug mode. In release mode, it won't get, be included. And so this corresponds in the compiler to when this debug setting is true or false. When, it's, when debug is false, you only get these assertions, the one that are just called assert, Quest, uh, assert exclamation point but if the debug is true you get both the asserts from that are just normal asserts and you get the debug asserts and if we look in the compiler itself uh in its source code for like where this debug assert macro shows up there's a couple places where it'll use either um the macro form itself to check things so like if we look in uh Where's, a, where's an example we might look for this? Um, uh, shoot, it's not gonna jump to the spot in the code um, for some reason. So like all of these invocations here that are checking that this thing is equal to this thing, which the belief is these, this should always be true for when this function is called, but you won't get that checking happening if you aren't building the compiler with assertions turned on. Now I have to admit, I'm I'm looking at this now and thinking to myself, like, why on earth did somebody think that this needed to be a debug assert? Like, it's not expensive at all. It shouldn't be expensive, I would think, to call any of these expressions and to do an equivalence check on a number. So I don't know why people, maybe people just, oh, it's possible that somebody did some instrumentation and determined this was this was such a hot piece of code that um, it needed to have that, needed to be conditionalized. But also another example is this. It's more typical to this kind of thing where somebody has debug assertions where the config flag debug assertion is guarding a larger block of code um, that does more complicated things in terms of either the checks are more complicated or more likely the instrumentation it prints out is, is, is complicated enough to compute and instruct that they don't want to include it in the binary even unless you've opted into that. It, it's important to remember that um, if, it, if this kind of code here um, if you encode this as, as a proper assertion, it, it shouldn't do the work of computing these, um, I believe, these things here, unless the assertion fails. There's a way to encode an assertion where it has extra um, printout information about the, the, the input that, you was, that was being tested. Uh, is there an example where I can see this here? Let's see. Probably not. No, not in this code. Um, let me see if I can find another one. What I'm, what I'm looking for here is an example where somebody was using a cert and passed in a different string for the, uh, like this. In the borrow checker,
this is an example I'm going to assert where somebody has customized the message that gets fed out. So instead of just saying that this Boolean flag is false and should be true, or sorry, this Boolean flag turned out true and it should be false, um, this person included a, a, a more a nicer message. Now that, that's not expensive either, actually, to, to to print out though or to compute. So the real thing I wanted to try to find was an example with a custom message that has um, extra information attached to it, which is usually like the same form that the log statements have of the format string. There's one right there. So. So here, if a race needs infer ends up being false, uh, ends up being true, then this thing is going to issue a debug assertion that prints out the about the debug formatted form of the erased object itself. So that's an example of something that might be an expensive operation to run, and um, so, but it won't be that it won't be executed unless this assertion doesn't hold. But there might be context where people say, you know what, it's expensive to even just have the code in the binary to do that computation. And we don't we want the compiler to be as fast as possible. So we're gonna we're gonna guard this under a debug assert so that the code that does any of this, including the computation of how to print out the formatted erased object, just won't be present unless you're running in debug build. Does that make sense? Yep. And uh just to uh like an extra question these debug assertions um stop the compilation the reg just like regular assertions yeah yeah they are just they are like they are hard stops um that will cause the system to panic um there's okay. other ways to say that you have I, I, you may have encountered this and i can't recall now but there's uh, pa panics from the compiler core end up corresponding to the internal compiler errors the ices are called ices um, cause I stands for internal compiler error. And so the kinds of errors you can get from the compiler, there's, there's, there's sort of two classes of error. There's the kinds of errors that are caused by the, the program text itself had a, had a mistake in it. And so we have the whole diagnostic system for that, right? That's something where the compiler should behave, should correctly identify that there is a problem in the code and issue a well-formed message that goes through the diagnostics machinery to print out nice structured information. But the other kind of error you might encounter is something where the compiler itself has a bug and either, and, and we detect this bug on the fly through checking these assertions. And that is the thing that will end up corresponding to an internal compiler error where you see this usually not nicely formatted message, but rather a, you know, just a sort of throwing up of the hand saying, I can't make progress. I don't know what to do. And I'm giving up. I'm going to, you know, stop the compilation right now. And that's, with these asserts and debug asserts or just outright panics, you know, people can just can people could write the code to just call panic directly instead of encoding as an assertion. They end up all meaning the same thing in terms of what the user experience is like. There is one other case though. There is um cases where people will we have this whole system for when we have a die when we have an error in the user program, we often try to recover from it. We often try to say, because like for example, parsing, you have a parse error where the there's a mistake in the user's program where there's something correct thing about the input and um, there's a mistake where they've written something and they left out a, a keyword or something like that, or, or they left out a bracket, who knows? The point is the parser can often do what's called parser recovery, where it will infer what the user probably meant, plug that in and then keep going. And the reason to do this is not because you want to successfully compile the program, you're still gonna not successfully compile the program, but you wanna search for more errors. You want to spit out as many errors as possible during the compiler run so that the user gets a larger batch of work to look, a larger batch of things to look at. Um, and also because sometimes that later information, there's cases where seeing that later information might inform you about how to resolve the first thing, although it's not that common. This is a general, more general concept than in parsing. This is something where you can count this in lots of places like type checking and whatnot, where you can have the system say there was an error, but I'm still going to keep trying to process the rest of the code in order to find more errors to spit out. Now, the big problem here is if you do this, and we do do this, this kind of recovery means that you can, you can sometimes leave the internals of the compiler in a state that doesn't make sense. There's invariants that you might expect to hold, but that weren't, were not established because the user's code was an error. And so because they didn't you know, finish everything the right way or whatever, there might be some parts of the internal structure of the compiler that 
don't make sense to the compiler. Uh, some invariant that's supposed to hold that has not been established. And so that could be a case where you do, might expect that to cause an internal compiler error. And the whole problem here is that we do not want an internal compiler error in a case where we're just trying to recover and spit out more usable errors for the user. It would be very bad to batch up some errors to report to the user and try to keep going and then have a panic and not report any errors to the user at all instead have a, instead have this internal ICE error that means the compiler is broken. So the other very special case that I want to make you aware of is um, delay, what's called delay span bug, I think is what it's often called, where that's meant to be used where if you find an internal error in the compiler, usually people will, this isn't always the case, but oftentimes you'll see people say, well, this scenario, this invariant that's broken, it's a bug. It's something that shouldn't be ever be broken, but I know it could be broken if there was an error in the user program. Like the only, only sorry, let me rephrase that. This is an invariant that holds for correct programs, right? For correct input programs. There might be an invariant within the compiler that you're saying, I know this invariant is always established if the input program was correct. And so the way to check for that then is to say, I'll check the check that this property holds. And then if it doesn't hold, I will issue what's I'll issue, I will make a call to this thing called delay span bug. Let me let me just prep for that too. Um, here I'll share my screen again so I can show you an example of it. Uh, so uh, delay underscore span span underscore bug everywhere in here. So yeah, so there's a whole bunch of these um, in all kinds of places. I'll I'll go ahead and jump to the. Um, Sure, the borrow checker, why not? Um, so, you know, this, this is just some random example of this, but the idea is that when you call delay span bug, um, the effect of this is it's gonna say, well, if there, if we eventually have an error that we admit, against the user's program. If we eventually have a diagnostic that we admit saying, there, your code is an error, then that means that this was not an internal compiler error. This was not a place where the compiler was internally broken. It's a case where there was a user error and we are going to report that to the user. So we don't need to report an internal compiler error in this case. We don't need to say there was an ICE. But the point of delay span bug that is to literally delay reporting an ICE so that, um, uh, where what we do is, oh, where was that? That's interesting. Um, I'm a little surprised that this is jumping there. That doesn't make sense. This is delay span bug. There must be something wrong with the, um, with the resolution here that LSP is using because it's jumping to the wrong place. Okay. Yeah. So the idea of this is that what, what delay span bug does is it just says, look, um, if the error count that we have is is non-zero or greater, or if we've had, there's, it's more complicated than that because it has to compare against some cell that we're carrying along. But, um, and it also has to do something special for treat errors bugs. And so there's some complexity here, but the point is the idea is that we basically just say, look, when we call delay span bug, we say, look, if there's has there been an error emitted? And if there wasn't an error emitted, um, then, or if, if we don't ever, sorry, <laughs> we, we, we're scheduling this ice to be emitted. We're saying, look, if we never report an error, then signal that there's an internal compiler error somewhere. Um, and we include the span of where that occurred. We try to include the span of what caused that internal compiler error from the user's code. That's why this is called the late span bug. It's feeding in both the, the span of the input source code from the user that caused us to hit this issue. Um, so yeah, that's a long, long digression, but the, the, the idea is that um, that you, these assertions, you can encode different kinds of assertions in the compiler um, and you should, you need to be somewhat careful about what you do because you don't want to panic the compiler. The, the, the main case you wanna worry about is the case I tried to just describe where you have some invariant you believe holds and you're gonna assert for it, but you need to be clear in your mind about, is this an invariant that holds always for both erroneous inputs and correct inputs? 
or is this an invariant that only holds for correct inputs? If you're in the latter case, where it's, it's some invariant that holds only for correct inputs and doesn't necessarily hold for erroneous inputs, then you need to use something like delay span bug to avoid um, causing panics to occur and us thinking the compiler is broken when in fact, it's just that there's some erroneous input that we got that we need to properly tag as such and emit a nice diagnostic. But if it's an invariant that's meant to hold in all cases for erroneous and correct inputs, then you can use either assert or delay assert, or sorry, assert or debug assert or panic as you like. And then the choice between these things is largely about how expensive is this check to run. Um, and I'm usually a fan of saying, if it looks like it's cheap, just go ahead and include it and wait till somebody says this is hot code. We can't slow this code down um, by adding these extra checks. And in those, that's when you would then resort to using debug, to debug assert or adding a config. The thing I showed, there was a, there was a case I think I showed earlier where um, there was a config flag you could use instead um, like this. Can't see the screen. Sorry, sorry, of course you can't see the screen. Um, So this, I don't even know if I, the font's big enough too. I hope, I'm hoping it is. Um, so yeah, so this is the other kind of case where you can conditionalize the code. And so that 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 debug flag in the config.toml file is gonna control both, both the emission of um, log statements, log instrumentation, log instrumentation, and it's gonna control uh, this debug assertions config flag, which in turn will, when it's true, it'll have anywhere you do debug underscore debug underscore assert with a um, exclamation point. Those this piece of this kind of piece of code will run, and likewise, blocks that are guarded by this config flag will be run. You can turn on. I believe the config.toml actually lets you um, control these flags on their own. So that's that's so if you for some reason um want to have debug assertions turned on um but not have debug info for the compiler turned on you can get that kind of fine grain control so in particular um this so yeah the bug info level is how you control the extra metadata that's emitted for a debugger like GDB. And so the debug flag that's at the top controls lots of things. Um, it control this, this flag here, this, this, uh, that's under the rust section, right? So corresponds, you, you might write rust.debug debug in some other specification um, system because there's ways to control the specific flags, I think in places where you can call, when you call x.py, you can feed in specific values for certain flags in the toml file. And this is the way you'd say this, this specific flag. And when this is true or false, that controls a lot of things. It controls this debug assertions thing that we've been talking about. That's what this indicates right here. Um, but it also, and likewise then that, that bubbles into other things like debug assertion standard, which those same assertions are embedded in the standard library that you build locally. And then the logging information about whether you have debug and trace calls turned on, that is inherited from debug assertions as well. So you can see how there's this trickle down from the Rust debug setting into these specific subparts. And likewise, um, overflow checks for, for numbers. When you have integers that your integer addition or subtraction happening or any kind of arithmetic, uh, if you exceed the bounds of the number, we check. We will check for that if debugging is turned on. Otherwise, it just uh, adopts wraparound semantics, um, and or modular arithmetic semantics. And then finally, debug info level is um, controlling the metadata that feeds into a debugger like GDB. And this is the thing where, if debug is true, it defaults to one, which means you get line numbers for functions and stuff. And you can set breakpoints at line numbers, but you don't get 
the type information for variables. For that, you have to have debug info level two turned on. Um, so if you're using a, if you're somebody who likes to use debuggers like GDB or Perdosco, um, then I, such as me, I often set this to two down here um, because I want to make use of that information. But the reason we don't set it to two by default, even when debug is true, is because of this note right here that says that it generates, de it generates gigabytes of debug info metadata and slows them the linker. So it's, it's expensive. It's not, it's not free. Okay. Yep. Yeah. No, that uh, clarifies a lot. And um, it, it's cool to know that I can fine grain tune it as far as I don't want the debug statements, but I want to keep the assertions and I want the GDB output. Um, don't know if I'll end up using it, but uh, it's good to know that they're independent uh, as far as you can tweak that. Um, yeah. So, okay. Then, so. Because the tests are run using the compiler that we've built. Um, so like, for example, when I'm compiling, uh, initially I'll do x.py build uh, library. Yeah. And the next times I'll do the same, but with keep stage one. Yes. That's um, usually a pattern. Yes. So how would I be able to basically do that? But like, what's the... What's the command for that, but when tests, like, so I can read, is there a way for me to reutilize the, um, the keep stage from a regular build versus running it with the tests? Uh, the tests, just... are you, so maybe I'm not understanding. So, cause the, the build for the, the tests, it shouldn't rebuild the standard library if you've already built it. Oh, you might, you might be, you can say, oh, I see, maybe I see. You can pass keep stage one to the test command. I believe. Yep, I did um, see that. Um, they don't. They don't really. Uh, I. I don't think in the Rusty Dev Guide it, it talks about like that. That is going towards the compiler you built, or I don't even know if it clarifies that the tests are just reusing the compiler that you built. So, is there a way for me to? <laughs> is there a way for me to um, when I I'm building the, through the tests? Mm -hmm. I think that the way to. So I, my memory here is that the way to sort of signal to x.py um, which compiler to use is with the stage. There's a dat, there's there's stage and there's keep stage, and I'm trying to remember now if build if like because like you could say I want to build just stage stage one, which I think is the default in the compiler profile. Or you could say I want to build stage two, which means I want to build the compiler, and then I want to use that compiler to build another, like build the compiler again, which is a much more uh, strenuous test of the compiler's capabilities since it has to, like you know, bootstrap itself again. Um, and the stage argument. The reason why I bring this up is because the stage argument, I think, um, is used for uh like if you're even the if you're doing tests if you're running the test command then i think the stage argument is used to control which compiler you're testing against so for example i, I could be wrong about this but i was i was thinking that if you passed explicitly stage zero if you did xpy stage zero i believe that what that would do it was it would run the tests against the compiler that you first download and don't build yourself um so there are ways to fine tune like which thing the tests are run against, I think, but the default is to run it against your own compiler, which you do by saying stage zero, stage one, sorry, which is the default, I think, for that scenario. I'm I'm making a lot of statements here and saying, well, how can I verify what I'm claiming to you, right? I, I, I'm making a lot of assertions uh, and then doubting myself as I say them, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. and. I want to see if the better the options I can see here are either we can like try to run the thing ourselves or we can look in the dev guide to see what it says. Um, so yeah, let's see here. Building versus running. I'm looking, let me look, let me go ahead and share the screen just to show what page, what page I'm looking at and we can maybe talk about it together. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you've read this page already um, that tries to talk it, that tries to explain about bootstrapping. Um, where it talks about the different compilers in terms of the stage yep. zero compiler is the one that you doubt we download for you and run. 
And then the stage one compiler is the one that you compile with that compiler. And the question that now is, okay, there's these options and it says what the defaults are for each one of these options, like building defaults to saying, I want to build a stage one compiler. Testing means I want to, by default, I want to test the stage one compiler. Um, for making a distribution, I want to, for whatever reason, make a distribution where I want to build a compiler and then use that compiler again to build another compiler, likewise for installing. So the, 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 it chooses these defaults, but you can override them. And in particular, the thing I want to double check is my interpretation of what test means. Yes, look at this. So if you are the tests, the standard library tests, um, but do it against the bootstrap compiler, so against the compiler that we download, this command would do that. So this is a way of saying, I want to run the test in the standard library um, and do it with the stage zero compiler that I downloaded myself. Uh, the reason one would want to do this is if you're developing, if you're like it says here, if you're working on the standard library, if you're making changes to the standard library itself, then this is a way to say, look, I don't want to spend the time building the compiler. I'm making changes to the standard library. I'm changing hash map in some way. I'm changing VEC in some way. And I want the, I want to run the unit tests associated with that library artifact. And I don't need to rebuild the compiler to do that. So you can select the compilers to use, but the only time you would really want to change stage zero for testing is when you're doing standard library development. Um, and it gives here examples of what not to do. Um, I'm trying to think of like, yeah, see, like this is an example where doing tests of the UI tests on the stage zero compiler is not, they're saying it's not useful because we hope that the beta compiler has already passed these tests. Um, it's possible, now I say that, but I'm sitting going, well, I could imagine scenarios perhaps where a UI test on your own personal platform behaves differently than on our CI system. And so maybe you'd get information from that in terms of seeing a test fail when it shouldn't. So it's not that it, is inherently like a no op or something like that. It's just that it's not a common thing to do um, because there's that's a pretty niche case where you'd have uh, a platform dependent difference on your local system that you'd want to investigate against the bootstrap compiler itself and not against a locally built compiler. Um, Ooh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, okay, I got a question now. So, okay. um, and I think I may have kind of answered it myself. Um, so I know when we're building regularly, X dot, uh, dot py build and we put something like library it's compiling a subset uh correct not yeah like yeah it's it's trying to get to the point of building the library itself that's right it's mm -hmm. it's it's not um because the default is to try to go further than that i believe um <laughs> and, and that default is what test is going to build by default correct no test needs to build actually more stuff test has to for example build the compile test utility that's something we build locally for testing the compiler and so if you just do build on its own my memory is that does not build the compile test utility the first time through so i wouldn't be surprised I've, at least my memory from the times i've run this is that yeah for example so uh, oftentimes when i do a x.py build and then follow the next.py test. Sometimes I get surprised by saying, by seeing it doing compile, like heavy duty compiles at first. I'm like, why are you spending so much time compiling? I just told you to do a build and you, you claimed you finished doing the build. But then I remember, oh, there's there's utilities like compile tests that it might need to rebuild. Um, okay, so that that explains it because uh, basically what I've been feeling and I've, I've started using the time function now um, <laughs> is that like, if I just built the compiler from making my changes and all that stuff. When I run the tests, it feels like it's basically doing the, it's recompiling what I just compiled already. Like it's not reutilizing anything. Um, Are you passing the stage argument along there? I'm trying to think, or keep stage. Well, that might be a case for you to keep stage. Let me think about this for a second. Are you using keep stage? I am not. So you might need to be using keep stage. Depends on what you've changed. If you haven't changed anything, um, then I'm a little surprised. Let's see. Um, so do I have a, 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 a build we can grab right here? Um, okay, so in my example here, I've got, I've done some builds and I'm not using keep stage in mine right here. So let me try your experiment myself locally, right? You can see what I'm doing, right? Um, yep. And hopefully this will go fast enough that we can get quick answers. So what's an example of a file that you might've changed? um in your experiments 
Um, give me I one? was I was doing a lot of stuff in Rusty and Fur. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So let's just uh, make a change there. You know, let's just touch. I'm just, I'm just going to touch the file to force it to rebuild. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So we see stuff get rebuilt. Okay. And the question I'm going to ask is, okay, what are we expecting to happen after we do this rebuild? Um. Well, for okay, first let's do a re, let's do a build, and then. So I'm expecting what this will do. Did I pass the library along? I did. I did you pass the library along. I did. Oh, you it's did. here. Okay. I did. But I also passed. I passed stage one explicitly, which is the default anyway. But I, I'm being explicit about it. Um, oh, this is a shame. This is taking longer than I hoped it would take. Um, uh, uh, and then when I run tests, I'm usually just doing the uh, tests uh, UI. Sure. Sure. Um, let me. What, the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I have the right intuition about rerunning even the build command and using. And I'm trying to remember now what will happen. What, should, what I'm expecting to happen here is it'll build the compiler and then it'll also build the standard library using that compiler. And I'm again worried about how long this is taking and sitting here wondering if I have something turned on. I do have debug input level equal to. I wonder if that's part, but it's not, I don't think that would be causing this much cost right now. All right. Well, nonetheless, um, uh, I'm, 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 I don't want to waste our time waiting for something that, that's supposed to finish faster than this. Um, okay, well, or maybe it's, this might be the link step now, actually. Um, that might be why this takes so long. Okay, there it goes. All right, so now it's building the standard library using the compiler we just built. Um, and that took way longer than I was expecting, but, but so be it. And the question is going to be, okay, what's going to get rebuilt? So the first thing I wanted to do was rebuild this uh, Redo, I want to redo this build again without touching the file and using keep stage and making sure that that works. Although I guess if I don't change anything, then that won't really test the situation. And this is taking long enough that maybe I'll just go straight to doing a running the tester or doing the test run. I think that's the way to go here at this point. Um, that's that's what I usually do. I, I run the, like build it. I maybe do some, um, some run some test cases on my own like outside of the, the test uh, harness and then I'll okay. run the tests. So let's go ahead and run. So what we'll do this time is I'll pass stage one. I will say test. Um, I'm going to pass in test U, test UI, right? And for just for, let's try this this time. Let's pass keep stage as well and see how this behaves. All right? Okay. Well, that didn't work. Um, is it test UI? There we go. So oh, okay. I didn't, that was a lot faster. So, so I didn't see anything get rebuilt there, right? And yeah, but I'm not sure. But there's lots of possibilities as to why that's the case. In particular, um, it's possible that my passing keep stage caused it to say, "Okay, I can reuse all the stuff that I already have, even though the compiler has been rebuilt." So mm -hmm. let, me let me interrupt this. Let's try not using keep stage this time. I remember you mentioned like uh I think in the first videos about keep stage and how you weren't even sure like sometimes how it works in specific contexts. Yeah, there's in particular there's the case where you can it's very it's very simple minded. It's basically a blind trust that you or that you have a standard library that you built and are confident will continue to work. And there's cases where this can get busted. Um so yeah, it's often something where people will just remove it if they find that the system starts behaving oddly or the build fails in weird ways. Um, so I didn't see anything change there. Um, so not passing keep stage, it's still included, um, right? It still seems like it tried to make progress there without making any changes. But so um, is, is that because like you compiled, so if you first ran it without keep stage, would that have been the case? I don't think so. Um, and we can certainly try that experiment right now. So the first thing we did before was we did, he said, build the same, we said build library stage one, right? That was the man we ran before. This should go yep. quickly this time, right? We didn't, we didn't do anything. We didn't make any changes this time around, um, right? It, 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 we could make another change again, maybe we would make, but let's, you know, this time let's make a change to something that's not quite so um, central to the compiler um, yep. as in for let's, let's maybe make it to rusty driver or something. Because that way, uh, oh, uh, which reminds me, has there been any changes to Rusty driver lately? I've noticed 
um, a lot of my builds lately are are taking a long time on rusty driver specifically uh i mean it's been changed within the last month clearly but i don't know whether it's changes that would mean that would be significant um because this you know it changed it, it doesn't change frequently you can look at like this this history right here says january 16th december 7th um december 6th and then Oh wait, and then there's a, another another change from January. I guess this is not being printed in order, um, right? Because it's good and it's out of order. All right. Well, there's been some changes to it. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that much about what changed. To be honest with you, you're saying it seems like it's taking a long time building Rusty Driver. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's just like my memory's not being. Well, clear, it might but... be the link. Well, it might be the link step is taking a. I Rusty Driver might be an expensive to link. Um so that might be a reason like i was just mentioning before how like look at how long it's sitting here on this on rusty driver right now and yeah my if i you know what i should do probably is we should probably i wonder if i can get more verbose information out of this um do i already have verbosity turned on i don't let's turn on verbose right let's see if uh oh wait if i change this file is that going to make this whole thing go slow uh i want to be careful because i don't want to change the config toml and have that rebuild everything um yeah so i'm gonna interrupt this build i'm gonna restart but i'm gonna pass for both i'm hoping that will not force it to rebuild everything um good okay so now we see this may not tell us anything because it's it's just telling us but this enormous command that it's running to build rusty driver that doesn't tell us um how long it's spending in linking um is there a way we can see that information easily? Um, I think there's a way that we can tell the, the Rust command that we want to know about the, because I, I, think, I think if we say, um, there maybe this is the, oh, link args. Link args is like the thing I'm thinking of. Um, will that, well, that still compile the system itself. Uh, basically, I'm, I was trying to remember whether there's a way to observe when the linker gets run. Um, I can't I feel remember, like I do, I derailed you from the previous thing. It's OK. I, yeah, yeah, it's true. I might have gotten derailed. Um, but at Nerd the same snap. time, I'm waiting. But nonetheless, I'm waiting for this to run over here. So. So we can oh, see okay. this this run right here. It is doing. It's building some other. It's running some uh, build scripts now. So in addition to running the build of, sorry, where was that? That was the, we we started by building the very beginning. We start off by building. Here, let's see. We start by building Rusty driver, and that was a big long command line, and then. There's even other stuff that we it's then building um, stable mirrors, the smear crate here, and then the main rusty main crate. And now it's doing building the library artifacts because I didn't pass keep stage one along. So I don't know whether the thing you're seeing is um, slowness due to linking, but it's certainly a, a guess I would make in any case and the question is how can we verify that and i think there might be ways to do it but i can't remember off the top of my head uh well maybe uh it's it's a thing to look at for like another topic about measuring the impact your stuff has on performance or yeah yeah i i'm trying to remember i can pass rust flags into um into the bootstrap system um to get it to do other stuff so if I pass in rust flags, that'll pass in, oops. Um, this will pass in a certain flags to all the compiler instances. And the question I was having was whether I could use that to trick the system into printing out the linker invocations. Um, without what by what but also allowing all the other stuff to still go through oh no maybe that was a bad idea let's see 
<laughs> you see, I think I might have changing the environment variables like that. Um, uh, full build. It said, it's like I got to do a clean build, buddy, because it's it's you change the environment variables that I read. So yeah, that might have been bad. Um, in terms of it's now re doing a whole bunch of more work, doing a full rebuild of everything and might may or may not even be telling us the information we wanted to see is the, is the shame of it right like so much like we're getting this this verbose output now uh on every single crate that it's building but most of them don't call the linker uh directly i'm pretty sure it only that only happens for the final binary i think uh i'm trying to remember now how our labs are generated in terms of whether they, they actually use the system linker or not at all and I can't recall, but I think I don't think I think we build those directly. I don't think we we use the system like to build those because we the format of them is is custom to Rust um, for building our libs, and so we pretty sure don't use the system link for that. We need it. We need the system linker for when we build. Ah, that's a linker invocation though. Um, okay, so here we have a build of Rusty driver and. I mean, okay, admittedly, I'm just going on by my gut, but I feel like this jumped from here to here pretty fast. So my guess is if if my experience is anything like yours, um, you might similarly see it be it might be jumping for you straight from this running command of, of saying I'm compiling Rusty driver, and then immediately afterwards saying, Yeah, and if you use this print this trick I'm using of passing Rust Rust flags print link args. I believe that's what's causing it to print out this line here where it's saying, here's how I'm invoking the quote unquote linker where the linker Rust is using the C compiler as a linker. That's why this is saying says CC here where instead of trying to figure out what the native linker is, we instead use the C compiler as a linker and pass it the object code that we want to link. Um, like this symbol Zo file and this Rusty driver file and all the other .o files that are in that are mixed in here. So we're just passing in a whole bunch of object code. And it's taking, it took, a, I, I didn't, the problem is I didn't have time information for that one step. So I don't know how long that took, but my gut is that it seems like it took longer than everything else for that step. So it's something to investigate and there might be other ways to find out the timing information there. Um, we have other flags um for timing the for timing stuff uh i thought we had something that was in the config file but maybe not hmm. Hmm. i thought there was some way it might be undocumented there's i thought there's some way to have the system print out how long it's taking for each step that it runs um but i'm not seeing it in the documented set of things and I might be mixing it up with something else. Uh, but there's like, cause there's this time passes flag for Rusty itself. And I had thought we made use of that in some way, but maybe I'm thinking of something else. Maybe it's, maybe it's the, the self profiling that we, uh, we have. There's, I thought there was, there's definitely something that we use for bootstrapping on the, we, we have a thing where we, have a whole website dedicated to measuring Rust's performance over time um, and keeping track of how it performs in terms of the compiler, how long the compiler is taking to build stuff. That loaded very quickly and has no data on it. That's sort of unfortunate. This is, well, I guess there's no, there, there are lines, Never mind. Um, and one of these, one of these pages is dedicated to the bootstrap times, how long it takes to bootstrap um, the system. And you'll see here like individual crates are being measured in terms of their, their timing. And I had thought that we were making use of uh, this this timing information to, to this instrumentation of the timing to get this information out for this system. But I don't remember how I don't remember what we feed into the Bootstrap system to make it spit out the info that feeds into this um, these charts here. Sorry, what was the uh, URL for that website? I can't. It's kind of small text. So I, I know. I know. I can. I can copy it over this thing where you will be able to read um so it's the main one is perf.rustlang.org we often okay. will abbreviate to perf that are i mean when we're in text chat i i don't know if you've seen this in, in the zulip chat or not but often things that end in rustlang.org people will just abbreviate to rlo in in, in zulip 
Um, oh, okay. And, that's, and so that's what that is. Yeah, yeah. And so this is so the main site is perf.rustlang.org. Gotcha. Um, and then at the top of it, there's a whole bunch of options for different pages to go to. Um, graphs, compare, dashboard, bootstrap. Um, but so like the dashboard link shows um, the average time for how various kinds of configurations are building. Okay, so uh, I can use this as a together. sanity check if uh, it's, for some reason I feel like Well, it's the really problem annoying. is, it depends on what you mean by sanity, sanity check. The problem is that this is running against a particular benchmark machine um, that we've kept yeah. like, the specs for stable for years or whatever. So it's the kind of thing where it won't tell you about the times on your local machine um, directly you might get some hint of like, if you're off by like, if your thing is 20 times slower than what's reported here, then that might be a hint of something, but you know, a factor of two, I wouldn't be surprised by. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, yeah, the no, more... I, meant, I meant more like just compares like, oh, uh, for some reason, compile times are much longer in the latest release. Ah, yes. That's yes. what I meant you by might, sanity you, check. You might be able to do that with it. Yes, especially with the bootstrap. Okay, so for example, actually, you just noted the bootstrap times. You said they, they seem like they might have gotten slower for Rusty main, perhaps, or Rusty driver. And in fact, looking at this graph here, if you look, the total bootstrap time has jumped up, it looks like. Um, if you look over here, can you see these, this blue line or not? Is it too yep, far for you yep, to see? Yep. Is that, um, say, January 14th on the, the start of the peak? Yeah, it seems like January. Yeah, January fourteenth. It looks like that's right. Um, and then it went. You know, it, yeah, that sounds about right. About when I kind of noticed the uh, mm -hmm. down. So yeah, yeah, it's not even check for, for this. And the well, the good thing is that this is this is um, by pull request. So you can click on the on the dot here, and it pulls up the diff for what the like what happened in that particular pull request in terms oh, okay. of the timings for what, what got slower and there's links to the pull request itself and the commit so we can jump over to that pull request this is a roll up of a whole bunch of pull requests and you know we don't know that it was this one that um see i i already investigated this in theory and so this doesn't seem worth investigating further but i don't think i noticed the bootstrap timing issue when I did that. And it's also noisy. It's possible that this data is quite noisy, right? You can see it jumping up and down. Yeah. So thinking that it's this particular pull request here, the, that same one we, I think we were just looking at, mm -hmm. it, it might be been the one before it or. Exactly, exactly. So it's the kind of thing where it's it's worth um, maybe looking at a few, you know, the, the sort of group over here, but yeah. it definitely seems like something happened in this. What space. is the, what is the times different? I can't see the, um the Y column. Um, um, the Y, there. yeah, good good question. Um, can I zoom in to help you with that? Yep, that works. So it looks so, like it was around 698. Um, and then it's kind of averaging around 702, 703. Yeah, yeah, I think that sounds right. Um, which is, you know, that I mean, that's, this looks like a big jump, but it's because this graph is not, um, yeah. what's the word, normalized? Like it's, 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 it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't start at zero. zero. It doesn't start from zero. That's right. So I don't know if this actually is meaningful, right? Um, and, and, uh, and who knows, like maybe, like you said, because it's on a specific machine, this, the changes there that it affected it a little bit might have affected me a lot, if it's even related to this. That's right. Um, so the point is this, we're looking at maybe a 1%. Right, a, a, a one or two percent slowdown, perhaps. Um, one sounds plausible, and so that's that's tough. It's something where that that is a, that is a that is significant. It's something we may want to investigate, but it's also it may be hard to uh, eliminate. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's worth it is it does seem it's worth knowing. It was probably a miss on my. It's it's hard though because especially when you're doing these investigations, the time when I was doing the investigation of this, that's because we do weekly triage where there's a performance team that goes and looks over the data for the last week for how mm -hmm. benchmarks because there's 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 report these reports that we get on the PRs that say we think that this is automated where the rust timer runs and spits out information about each PR when it believes it might have regressed something and there's a team that's supposed to go and look look over the uh, instances from the from the last week 
And I I did this review on eight on the eighteenth. Um, so arguably that was long enough ago that I probably should have been able to, I, I will admit, I don't think I looked at the bootstrap times at that when I did my review, then I should have. Um, so looking at this, I probably should have seen this graph and said, uh, maybe something's going on that we need to care about in terms of this jump. Um, but it's okay. Better late than never. Um, so yeah, that might be good to, to note somewhere. Uh, is there anything else? Let me uh, go ahead and stop sharing for a second. And, uh, anything else you wanted to talk about, Matt? Um, not, not really. I think not, nothing particularly when it comes to general tests and, um, and compilations. I think this helped a lot with, with clearing things up for me for compilations. Uh, I, I need to look through the rusty dev guide a bit better. And then this was very helpful. So awesome. Um, yeah, I do have some other questions when it comes to, but it's, it's not exactly related to it's a bit more working group specific for like diagnostics okay. um and this is something i think i'm gonna maybe try to talk to uh, michael in his uh meeting hours or something but like um when is something worth suggesting and when it's not uh or like uh, well i think the real question there is is how precise can you make the suggestion how mm -hmm. there's there, the, the dimensions here are how expensive is it to figure out the correct suggestion, right? Is it like could it usually costly the compiler to even figure out the thing to suggest? And mm -hmm. then how sure are you that the suggestion is correct, right? We want to, we, we really want to avoid is issuing suggestions that in fact lead people astray. Um, and, and, so, and then I've, I've, I've ran into some cases where it's like the suggestion in certain cases would not fix the problem, but it would get them one step closer and the next suggestion would fix it. Is that like, is that an acceptable thing? Is as long as it's kind of on that path, it's acceptable. Um, but then how do you know that's the right path? That might just be kind of like an edge case as far as that particular. That's case. true. That's true. Can you be more specific about that? I, I, I've encountered the pattern you're describing where I've like, mm -hmm. you know, made a change and didn't fix the thing, but it did produce better output from the compiler. And you might, Look, the ideal thing would be for the compiler to figure out how to make that jump itself, right? Like, like mm -hmm. if, if, if the computation were free or whatever, and it was able to plug in the right, the same way I was talking about parser recovery before, mm -hmm. there's other parts of the system that it do try to recover to make inferences about, well, if we, if we made this change, then what would happen? And um, so it sounds like this is semi-related, um, but do you have a specific, more specific like case in mind of where you've encountered this? Uh, I mean, so I, I finally got my first PR uh, approved, and it's it just got rolled up, and that's good. It took <laughs> it took about a month and a half of Michael just <laughs> tearing apart my 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 PR and just like have. I mean, I learned a lot by by um, comments and his suggestions. Um, and that actually kind of led to like, I think in the first office hours we had some of my initial questions is like, um, how do you know which parts to look at in the compiler? And this kind of mm -hmm. went towards like debugging statements and, and that scope thing. So I have a, I have a commit uh, or I have a PR and I can, I, I'll, I'll, I'll share that. I'll, I'll show my okay. uh, <laughs> stumbling. Uh, it's not a problem. And, um, and it it kind of went as do you far want, as do like, you want to do you want to share sure, your sure. screen? Would that be the simplest thing to do here? here. Uh, yeah, I, that's. Let me see. Let me see if I even can. I'm using the. Uh, yeah, I'm using the browser. That's why. So you can't. No, I, I think I can. Um, Great. Can you okay. can you see my screen? I, I believe so. This looks like yes. This looks like it's probably your screen. Okay, so and you, does the text look okay? Yeah, looks great. So, um, yeah, you can see, like, I forgot to run the test suite, mm -hmm. uh, and so there is there is like fifty or sixty like comments and suggestions, um, and so it'll be things like, uh, like I initially when trying to identify whether sure. something was a function was using strings. And, and then Michael's like, use types to check. So that's when I started yeah. learning more about like type middle, uh, Rusty middle. Um, 
then things like here about the semantics or not semantics, but like the, the style guides for for, for comments um, and you know making language inclusive uh, what else there was a lot um, I was using a, a help instead of a, a suggestion suggestion yeah yeah these are things um, that I'm not surprised like I think that it's a lot to cons lot to digest all at once in terms of like knowing about all these things. Yeah. And I mean, I could imagine maybe there might be like notes we could put elsewhere in the dev guide or some like guidance here, but, I'm, but I think it's also part of the, you know, the learning process. Learning of, process. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm not surprised by any of this. Um, yeah. So some of the things was like, Oh, some of them were actually, some of our communications was in, in, in private chat on Zulip as well. And I was asking, and then I asked that question about um, I asked that question about um, if it gets you a little bit closer, should we do it? And then um, I saw some of the affected tests, and I guess so. Was I, it this was it this comment here that you're talking about? Is the one where like you, you see evidence that it was spitting out? Maybe I'm mis, mis uh, identifying what you're you're saying no, um, no it was it was I, I don't think i'm even looking at anything kind of specific because I, I think it was just oh, like okay. a general theme of this whole pr was was me um stumbling my way through adding uh adding things or removing things and n you know learning about just how wide that scope is mm -hmm. as far as what it can affect in the compiler and sure. yeah this is my <laughs> oh it's my, great my, you should be proud. You should be proud. I I know you can, can be embarrassing to have to show your work, but I think this is great. Um, but yeah, okay. But yeah. So back to the, so back to the original question. Then I think I think the answer here it's it's going to depend, I and mean, really it's going to depend on a like the, the scenario you talk about where you know moving someone a step towards the answer. My gut feeling is like that has to be better than nothing. Um, if there's if we have no other information. Right, like like giving someone no one, no guidance at all versus giving them nudging them in the right direction and them and actually closer to the right answer seems like has to be the right thing. So the question is, okay, when would it be the wrong thing? Because we're not in the absence of other other information, and and the the crucial pieces of it are, I think, um, when someone one, opens an issue. What? When someone opens an issue. Oh, and like, so you make the change, and someone like is confused and opens an issue, saying they're confused by the diagnostic, like that. You mean? Yeah, or, uh... yeah, because uh, because we don't have a test that actually um, that demonstrates a case where it would give the wrong. I see. Right, right. That's then, and that's the kind of thing where you have to, you know, suffer with that. I guess you either have to predict the cases where it can go wrong up front by try, you know thinking or thinking about the problem and the different kinds of inputs that it might encounter. Right. Mm -hmm. This is something that we, where some people are pretty good about imagining uh, in the, the dimensional space that the system has where different diagnostics might lead one astray and how to narrow down. And then that even then, though, it's not a reason not to do the diagnostic. It's a reason to try to um, make it more specific, more precise. And when it fires to avoid the misleading cases uh, and oh. uh, and um, a lot of the comments that Michael had actually. The source of it was from the failed test cases, which is mm -hmm. goes back to why I guess you're you're emphasizing our need to have more tests from the actual issue it stemmed from, like in the PR. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, well, this has been great, Matt. I'm so thrilled that you got a PR in. That's really <laughs> amazing. Um, Working on my second one. No, oh, it's fantastic. I'm I'm very I'm very excited that this is this is huge. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to see, the, you know, the, yeah, go ahead and, and we don't really have a channel for people to, we don't have a, a strict way for people to report about potential signs of, it, it's a funny thing, you, you said yourself, it seems like Rusty, compiling Rusty Main got slower recently. I know in my life, there's been several times where I have been doing something locally and saying either this seems like it's gotten slower or this seems like it's breaking and I don't think it, and I thought it used to work. And I'll admit, like, I'm the kind of person where oftentimes I don't ask other people, like I assume it's just something wrong I'm doing and I'll spin my wheels trying to figure out 
what I'm doing wrong locally. And almost always I have been wrong in that default behavior, even though I still do it to this day because of whatever social issues I have with like, you know, assuming that people don't want to hear about my nonsense. And the point is that I can only encourage, it, there's no harm in going into one of the chat spaces in Zulip and just, you know, opening up a topic and saying, hey, do people, do people observe that like this seems like it's going slower or do people also have problems like, you know, with this piece of the code, it's not behaving, this test is failing. Because there's, especially with flaky tests, if a test that's failing, for example, and you're yeah. like, what did I do wrong? Why is this test failing? It might be that the test is a flaky test that other people are observing failures on. Or it might be that the compiler's icing. There might be some incremental compilation failure that people, other people are ignoring, but in fact, other people are still witnessing and just ignoring. There's all kinds of cases where you can see weird behaviors and the right thing would have been to signal to the group at large just to find out if, no, if for no other reason to get confirmation that it is your private problem or isn't, right? The, the reason to communicate in many ways is to at least know for sure, yes, this is something that I'm only seeing locally and it's something specific to my setup or if it isn't. And that, that bit of information can, can be so crucial in figuring out what's going on. And the only way you're gonna get that bit of information is by sharing your experiences with others. Um, um, so I've, so this, um... It kind of reminds me of something like, you know, when you with Windows or, or Ubuntu or you install some things and it asks if you'd like to send diagnostics back. Yeah. Um, is, I don't know, what do you think about if there was just like a little, uh, I don't know if it's like a hook or something that the contributor a, can voluntarily use this is a and it very, wraps? This is a very, very, very active topic like literally right now it's something we've been talking about for years mm -hmm. there's a essentially and i think the, the answer here i'm trying to remember if it's been posted officially as a major change proposal i think it has um let me double check so and i'd, I'd be the, happy to, to to put it on my machine as a the the, the 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 thing you're asking about is called the, the technical term for it is telemetry um yep. and basically um, Esteban, who Esteban Cooper is mm -hmm. a uh, contributor. Somebody works with me with me uh, over at Amazon. Um, and here I'll just show you. They they are actively working in this investigating this space, and that they're trying to find a path for us to give exactly what you're talking about in terms of mm -hmm. providing ways for people to give feedback um, more effectively. And so the first, a step that they are taking towards this is this, this MCP right here. Um, Could you um, share that as a, as a link or in the chat? Or yeah, what? yeah, let me pull up Zulip. Um, Thank you. I'm interested so, in this as well, so. Yeah, I think, so the, the, the basic heart, but the, the real response here is that um, we've been talking about this for ages. Another case where it came up big time was actually let me share my screen again well let me find the link first and then i'll share my screen um we had a a collection of issues last year or two years ago in the compiler where the incremental compiler was failing in a certain way and we didn't realize how bad the problem was we didn't realize how bad the incremental compilation errors were um until we issued a release and then we started getting bug reports from people and we, um, it would have been much better to have a better feedback earlier that didn't require a manual step of people having to file a bug report saying that the compiler is, is failing in this way. And so that's an example. So the two, the two main examples of places where we definitely would like to have better telemetry are ISIS, incremental compiler failure errors. And the other one where we want better telemetry is diagnostics. We want ways for, we would, like to have ways to know whether diagnostics are helpful or not in particular the big case that esteban is very interested in investigating is he wants to esteban wants to know when people how people respond to a diagnostic the change they make and what diagnostic they get next and he wants to know whether they end up in a cycle where they make a change diagnostic gets ch diagnostic changes they make another change diagnostic changes and eventually they end up back where they started because that's an example of something where whatever the path was, it seems like it was bad um, mm -hmm. to, to, to not actually lead you toward an answer. So 
uh, and there's other kinds of, and that's one imagined scenario. There's other scenarios where we, we, we just feel like we don't know enough about the user experiences and we sh could hypothetically get this information if we had automatic telemetry. The problem is that this is a very fraught topic because uh, when you're dealing with compilers, you're dealing with source code where you, you, you sure people can opt in and would opt in, but a lot of people would be very concerned about the dangers here about, I think mainly about people opting in without realizing what it is they're opting into and what information is being sent upward. Like and so the it's a, of what they're opting into. Exactly. Exactly. Like is the source code, if our copy of the source code being sent up as well, which, you know, in, an, in some worlds would be like, that'd be awesome to have the source code so we could test things locally against the original mm -hmm. thing. But of course, um, it's very like it's it's it'd be terrible to do it automatically without like even opting in. It's like a horrible thing to do automatically because it's so dangerous to people in terms of information leakage. Um, so and and like who knows what information from your computer, like what other information, whether it's your IPs or something specific about your machine that may be sensitive for you specifically. Exactly, exactly. So this is an area that we definitely want to invest in, and we're trying we're trying to figure out how far we can go and the conversations we can have with the community at large about it. And Esteban is someone that I trust very much to, to be thinking about uh, keeping the trust of our community. Like our community health is like Esteban, the most important thing to Esteban, right? If a project like this goes off the ground, gets off the ground and then they end up saying, we can't get, we don't get any information at all. Esteban, I think we'd rather have that happen than to lose trust from the community members. So mm -hmm. there's someone that I trust to like make good decisions here. Um, they want to attack the problem. And I think a lot of it is going to be about both figuring out the ways of what, figuring out what information can be fed automatically and automatically um, hidden in terms of there's, there's things that he's looking at with differential privacy, ways to automatically process information in such a way that you can uh, uh, transform the responses so that you'd never learn anything about individuals and yet can still learn information about the group is like the, the system as a whole and how what the responses are like as a whole and then the other thing Esteban is heavily working on I believe is ways to make it easier for people to package up their experience and like whatever the problem was they had and then get a concise view of what it is they are sharing and make it a very easy thing to like issue file the bug mm -hmm. but have it be something where let's like like you could imagine like as an example of the kind of thing that we're talking about is something where you click a button or you you type in a URL or whatever that the, the compiler spits out for you. And then you go to a certain page and it tells, tells you, okay, this is the bug report you are about to file. Here is the information that you are putting in the bug report. I haven't filed it yet. Read over this and make sure that you are okay with this information being shared. Mm -hmm. um, and that way the act of hitting the submit button is still in your hands. And right, if you don't do that, then nothing gets up. Nothing gets and up. You can audit audit it. And you can audit it. So that's an example of a kind of experience, a kind of experience that may still have some risk, but is way less riskier than the compiler automatically feeding information back. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I would like to see that, because there's cases where I would like to see the compiler automatically spitting information back up to us, mm -hmm. but it's very risky. And then you, and then like the individual can kind of do kind of like how you do with rollups, like just send it in batches um, whenever you feel that, or even a subset of the batch. Yeah, you know, depending on what yeah. we're doing, depending on what they're, depending on what the individuals are doing, and depending on what we're doing. I, I, my ideal world, we'd see, you know, crash analogous to like the crash stats that web browsers have, where they have these, mm -hmm. you know, because web browsers get so many reports that it's not like you see individual bugs about crashes. You see like mass quantities of data about, you know, the distribution of where crashes are coming from for the like that's how the stack traces are, um, yeah. the normal distribution of them or whatever. And so, I, I imagine it'd be something like that, at least for ICEs. Diagnostics okay. might be more more personalized. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for sharing that info. I'm definitely going to look. Yeah. More no into problem. It. No, it's a great. I'm glad to hear you're interested in it because like, you know you brought it up yourself, and I was like, oh wow, I'm glad to hear somebody like from outside is like <laughs> recognizing that this is a real problem that we don't actually have mechanisms for this. Mm -hmm. um, we know we knew this, and I've told other open source projects like you should build this in at the outset. Like I think we, I think we would have been in an easier spot to add this if we had had some support from the outside. Like we had had some mechanism in the system, a small one that we could evolve gradually. Because right now it's just, it's really hard to inject something like that entirely new into a mm -hmm. system that has no support for it. Because then you just have this backlash of 
the system doesn't behave at all like this. And that's the, what I, that's what I bought into when I used it. I think that, so I've, there's been other projects, other tools that I've talked to where I've said, look, if you care about getting information from your users, like automatically, you may want to think about having telemetry from the outset. Um, and, and of course, making sure it's opt-in and all this stuff, like all the same stuff about trust and making sure people understand what they're getting into. But I still think there's a, a very serious, um, hurdle to get over in terms of just when you initially if you don't put it in initially it's it's hard to get it in later yeah like many things like security and like like incrementality uh, telemetry seems like it falls in that bucket too and all right who knows, maybe maybe the user can uh choose to have all of their uh submissions taken back or deleted uh that's true scenario. that's that would that would be that, would, that might require the problem with that is that would actually require tying some identity to the submission which might be anathema to privacy yeah. in the first place yeah um but there might be a way to hide that. You're right. There, there still might be ways to have it be where your identity, where you have like a key or something, like a, a token that we mm -hmm. don't know who you are, but someone with that token has the right to get the to, to limit the information. That's actually an interesting, interesting idea that I don't know if we've broached yeah, that. Double blind um, kind of uh, approach. Exactly. That's that's actually a very interesting idea. Maybe I'll mention that to Esteban later. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. Oh, thanks for Bye. your time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.